Hi, welcome back to My Perspective. I'm your host, Shelby. I'm so excited you guys are here. I have a podcast episode for you that is near and dear to my heart, something that I honestly haven't even really opened up to many people in my life. For some reason, I find it really hard to talk about mental health, whether it's because of the stigma or because I'm so afraid of being shut down. We'll obviously get into all of that, but basically, I'm going to be talking about my journey with mental health, causes slash things to do to improve your mental health, whether I've done it or I have heard it works. Stick along for today's episode. It is something that I think a lot of fruitfulness can come out of and I'm honestly really nervous right now to talk about, but before we get into the episode, let's do our segments. I didn't even write these down this week. My update of the week, I don't really have any, I think. Well, no updates for this week, I guess. I, oh, I'm going to Disneyland tomorrow so excited. I have not been to Disneyland for almost two years. I love Disneyland. I grew up going as a little kid. I had a pass all the way through high school and my mom would just drop me off and I would go to Disneyland by myself all the time because at that time it was pretty safe to just go on your own. I loved walking around. I loved going on rides and as I've gotten older, I'm now moved back to Orange County so I can go but it is very expensive. So my best friend Brooke is taking me for my birthday. That was back in May, but I low-key already knew or had an idea that she was taking me to Disneyland, so I intentionally pushed it back this far. We probably could have made it work a lot better, but I was waiting for the Christmas decorations. Christmas is one of my favorite times of the year. I love the decorations. I love the food. I just love the ambiance, so I'm very excited about that. My like of this week, huh, my obsession of this week, what has it been? I have no obsession of this week or dislike. Honestly, this week's segments, pretty much I've just been making my Christmas list. I met a new friend. She was so sweet. I met her from TikTok. I just reached out to her. So you just, you got to reach out to people. Uh, My dislike though this week, I've been very overwhelmed. I have one of my first tests for my health coaching class coming up and I am quite behind. So I need to get on that. I'm still working for my brother-in-law, but have the pressure of needing to find a job as soon as possible. Yet I'm having a hard time finding the time to apply to all these jobs and then later finding out they are either hiring from within or I'm not qualified. There's a lot of, I feel like logistics that go into a applying to a job or just the posting in general. It's really disheartening when I never hear back or I'm not the fit and I understand, but the job market's a lot harder than I thought it was going to be post-grad. I have a lot of anxiety when it comes around money from growing up with not a lot of money and the thing is the amount of money I'm making right now is no less than I was making in college. I'm so much harder on myself now than I was in college about not making enough. When I'm fine, I have a savings, like I can get by the next couple of months without having a job. I don't know, it's hard because I don't want to work in front of a screen nine to five. Like I really, really don't want to, but for some reason I know that's just what was expected post-grad and I kind of envisioned for myself. It's been an odd feeling knowing that that's not the life I want or see myself doing. The life I do see myself is having a podcast, doing social media, really going about my life. I already know the life I envisioned for myself. Working at a screen for eight hours a day is not it. So basically I was listening to two podcasts this week that really inspired me to one, talk about my job as being this podcast. Like if I'm not talking about it as my podcast, then it's never going to become my dream or my job. Basically any other job that I have to just keep the lights on and provide food on my plate is called a bridge job. That is my bridge to keep the lights on, to keep myself going, but really my full-time job is this. If I'm out and about the town and I meet someone, they're like, oh, what do you do? I need to say I'm a health and wellness podcaster because I want to build my network in this field, not necessarily construction or event planning or whatever, whatever industry I'm currently working on, whether it's serving or working at a tech firm. I don't want to build my network in that as much as I do in this current field that I'm in. So if I start talking about it, it will eventually come. It reminds me of the law of attraction a little bit. And I think I just need to implement it and not be so afraid of doing something that's not the ordinary or something that people say I'm going to fail at or won't provide money. Also talking with so many people, they encourage me to just 
go for it. This is the best time for myself to fail. This is the best time for myself, for things not to work out. To If I fail, you know what? That's just one right step and that's one right turn into the right direction of where I'm ultimately supposed to be. And I'll never get there if I never try. I won't be able to fix anything if I never go for it. I DM'd Peyton, who is the host of Note to Self, before I had a podcasting, I've always wanted to do it for the past couple of years. And she told me I can only learn so much from not doing it. And I was like, you're right. I can't fix my podcast. I can't make it better if I never record, edit, and post it. We all know the first time you do something, it's not going to be good. We kind of all kind of know that, but we have to give ourselves some slack that it's going to get better. I'm going to stop rambling about this. I will definitely pick up on it one day when I'm just going to start being more serious about what I'm doing and not being so afraid to be open about it. I have a podcast. I talk about my life on here and I help people become better versions of themselves while I'm trying to do the same thing at the same time. Let's talk about mental health now. I do want to give a trigger warning to anyone who struggles with with depression. I'm gonna go very deep and dark in that section. If you can, you know, I have plenty of other episodes you can go listen to. This is the 30th episode, so if you can't listen to that sort of stuff, just find a different one. When I went to fresh, when I was a freshman year of college, there was free therapy provided, and one of my friends told me about that. My therapist loved her. Her name was Allison. She one day asked me, do you think your depression is seasonal? Or do you think it's a chemical imbalance slash you've had it your whole life? And I originally answered, I think I've always had it because as far as back as my memories could go, I remember being that kid that cried all the time. I was very deeply sad. Sometimes life didn't feel worth it. However, recently I listened to a podcast episode and multiple episodes actually about brain health and brain trauma. And this psychologist who specializes in brain scans and trauma, especially in celebrities, always ask questions about, were you an athlete growing up? Did you do something like soccer or football? Or did you have some type of trauma in your life? Basically, he equates that if you have so much trauma to your head, your brain is extremely soft. Soft as maybe... I don't know, like pudding or something. And your brain is extremely hard with a lot of rough edges. So if you whack your head on a soccer ball, a football, me, I was a gymnast for 10 years, you are shaking your brain and bruising it and it actually will appear differently on the scans that he does. But your average person, your middle class, low class average person can't obviously go and get those scans. He talked about how people have become, um, he's scan brains of when they're serial, not serial killers, but like pathologically, sociologically messed up in the brain. I don't know the proper term for that. Or someone who really struggles with mental health, obviously. He scans these people's brains and he realizes that a part of their brain is completely shut off. And a lot of the times he can help them with certain protocols. And when I think back to my childhood, I don't remember being sad as a kid. I remember being sad more when I became in middle school. Personally, I've had at least three concussions in my life and one of them left me being very disoriented because when I was a gymnast, not only was I hitting my head all the time because that is gymnastics and you have to learn to properly fall and that's a lot of the drills, but I had a huge mental block where when I would go and tumble on the floor, I also will get into it, but I had OCD now realizing. Basically, I would stand there for 10 minutes because I was so terrified of tumbling just out of nowhere one day. And if someone messed up my ritual or during the actual skill, it felt a little different than it normally did, I would completely bail on the skill, land on my head, which is first thing of gymnastics you're not supposed to do. You're never supposed to bail on a skill while you're doing it. And I would fall full force on my head, but I was so determined to not do it again. I would immediately go back in line and retry the skill and do it again and fall on my head. And my coach is like, you need to sit down. And that is where I remember my first concussion. There's a lot of studies that show a link between repetitive head injuries like gymnastics or soccer, football, and an increased risk of mental health issues, including depression and anxiety, because you're actually damaging your brain. That makes so much sense because 
I remember starting in middle school being extremely sad and just thinking that was normal. There's also a link with mental health with trauma. So if your parents fought a lot or something other something really traumatic happened, like your parents got divorced, your childhood experiences can also alter your brain function, which can impact your mental health. I think I've always had anxiety as well, but I didn't really know. Basically, looking back at when I went to college, I got diagnosed with anxiety, depression, and OCD. And when I look back to myself as a gymnast, I had a lot of rituals that are honestly quite common for gymnasts and just seemed as normal. And I would do these hand fidget rituals or body rituals before I would do a skill. And if someone messed me up, like I said, if someone was in my peripheral vision, if the skill didn't feel right, it would actually wreck me. My coach one time told me mental blocks or being afraid of something is a reason to quit the sport. And I was so determined not to. I ended up quitting because I lost complete function in my entire body from... I believe nerve damage. I was laying in bed one night and could not even move my pinky fingers. Like I was completely paralyzed my whole body. I couldn't even move my fingers or my toes because I was in such excruciating pain in my back. And that's why I ultimately quit the next day. I told my coach what happened. I was like, I want to walk when I'm older. Or she told me like, do you want to walk when you're older? Or do you want to be a gymnast right now? And I was like, I want to walk when I'm in a mom and I want to have kids. She's like, oh yeah, well you need to quit. So I told her I want to do one more competition and then I'm done. But when I look back, I totally had OCD when I was a gymnast and I didn't even realize it. And we saw a mental block therapist or specialist my last year, but at that point it was, I was way too far gone. Another backstory was I remember I used to go to an acupuncturist when I was a gymnast as well. It was one of my first times going. They were also, they did Chinese medicine. So, and they were a chiropractor. Basically they made me leave the room and they talked to my dad and I was really confused why they made me leave the room. And when we're driving home from the acupuncture, I asked my dad, I'm like, hey, uh, why, what did they talk to you? Why did I have to leave the room? And he's like, oh, super nonchalantly, like did not take it seriously. And he was like, oh, they just told me that the position your neck is in, the degree of your spine or whatever, you have a very high risk of suicide. In that moment, I didn't think too much of it. I was like, oh shoot. It's kind of like if you go see like a fortune teller and they're like, you're gonna die by this age. That's how I kind of felt. Oh shoot. And they obviously like fixed my neck and hopefully I don't have that problem anymore. The fact that maybe they could see something like that from the position of my neck and my brain, I still remember to this day that kind of foreshadowed later in my life. Brain health, I think, plays a huge role in how, what you eat, how you sleep, and all these different things. Also, when it comes to mental health, I struggled a lot with my body image, and I do agree that is a part of mental health. There are so many mental health conditions in the DSM-5. I'm just not ready to talk about that yet. I definitely think that one day I will talk about my body image issues and food and everything, but that is not something I'm ready to talk about right now, which is actually kind of crazy because I'm more open about that usually than my depression. At this point, I don't know why I'm comfortable talking about this, but whatever. In high school, I was always sad, whether it was about my family, whether it was about friends, low self-esteem, or just wanting to escape. And I really got into, not really, but I did have a period of time where I partied a little bit in high school. And I think that's why I don't party too much now. I thought drinking alcohol was so cool, or maybe it was just because my parents wouldn't want me to do that. But I just never wanted to be home. I never was happy. I didn't understand my emotions. I either was crying all the time or I was so shut off I wouldn't cry. And still to this day, my coping mechanism is extremely avoidant and I don't want to talk about it. Hence why I don't talk to my friends about my mental health, which is actually insane. I think it's either I'm telling someone who I just met, their reaction won't really, won't really hurt my feelings, but there's time and time again where I express my experience with something that is very hard for me to share already and I get shut down so quickly or they tell me something very condescending. They they just like hurt me more than if I just wouldn't have said anything or I've even had friends who've pried out information and then gotten mad at me for telling something that they first originally wanted to hear because I didn't tell them sooner or they think I'm selfish or whatever the reason was it made me feel worse originally. That's been a really hard thing to accept as well because 
because I do want to share. I do want to have that sense of community and support, but I never feel like I can. I don't feel like there's anyone who can really understand and hear me. So then college comes around and this is where my life turned upside down. Prior going to college, I knew I struggled with something whether it was depression, anxiety, or even my body image, which we're not going into, like I said. Um, But I knew I wasn't, I wasn't mentally great, you know? At first, I really did start with a great friend group, which I thought at the time. Very quickly into my freshman year, within the first quarter, I was experiencing a panic attacks, which I've never experienced before, to the point where I was getting a panic attack almost every single day. And it was really, really hard, and I don't really know what they were about. So I started going to therapy, and that's when I was diagnosed with anxiety and depression um, and one other thing. And then I didn't get diagnosed with OCD till a year ago. They put me on anti-anxiety and depression meds, which was crazy because in the first month, I felt amazing. I was so happy. Yeah, everything was great. But then I got really dark suicidal thoughts. And that is something I probably told less than five people in my life. So I knew a side effect of antidepressants was suicidal ideation, I think it's called. So I immediately went off them. Cold turkey, I only have been on them for a month. And the doctor was like, you know, we can try a different form. Like we have so many here. And I'm like, no, I, I'm i not for it. I tried it. It didn't work. I've never had that deep of dark thoughts before. We're not going to do that. I went off the meds. I decided that I was still depressed. So I decided that getting a dog would make me happy. And if I were focusing on something else, then maybe I can take care of myself better because I, I spend way too much time on myself. I think about myself way too much. So if I'm thinking about something else and something somebody else's, if they're eating, if they're drinking water, if they're exercising, then I will be better in turn. So I got a dog. I also went through a huge friendship group breakup my freshman year that left me extremely sad and I felt very alone because I didn't have anyone else to talk to and I felt so isolated. The one person I did want to talk to because I knew she had struggled with the same thing in high school, I didn't feel like she would want to talk to me. I felt so alone, so alone my freshman year. I ended up leaving college early and went back home because I I just I couldn't stand being there anymore so those thoughts came back my sophomore year and it always came when I drank and I went to bed late and I think it's because I was alone and I wasn't getting distracted anymore but when I knew I had a real problem was when those thoughts came back and I was telling my dog goodbye I was telling him that someone else was going to take care of him Or I knew it was bad when, so when you're in a relationship, the first couple of months, you have so much of a dopamine hit from that honeymoon phase that it's kind of a band-aid on your mental health sometimes where you don't feel sad for a couple of months. And I remember Max telling me, you were never sad when we first started dating. Like, what has happened? And in that moment, I felt really bad about myself. But then I realized, no, I've always had this little bit of depression in me. Our relationship at first really masked it. And I never really showed you. And also we just got together, so I'm not going to trauma dump on you. But I knew it was really bad again when I was sitting, I was laying with him in his dorm. I was having those thoughts with him in the next room. He's in the bathroom. And I was having those thoughts, those really dark thoughts of I don't want to be here anymore with him in the room. Like, how could I feel that sad when the person I love most in this world is sitting directly next to me? Max was so sweet about it and he made sure that I reached out to one of my friends the next morning, made sure I told my therapist, made sure I got the support I needed. I was so upset at myself because I was like, why am I struggling so much with my, like, just being happy? Like, everybody else is happy. I go to therapy. I wake up early. I work out. I eat well. Like, I have a dog. I have people that love me. Why do I have these problems. Since then, I, since my sophomore year, I've been doing a lot better. If you're wondering now, 
I was in basically therapy all of college and I currently stopped therapy just because I feel a bit overwhelmed. I definitely think I need it, but I think I need a break on self-development. I'm not having those deep depressive thoughts right now and my OCD is actually very manageable. I still have actually, I thought for a long time I didn't have anxiety because I didn't have panic attacks anymore, but I didn't realize that being extremely fidgeting, peeling my fingernails apart, having anxiety going in grocery stores or talking to people or just like random little anxiety things. I didn't realize that was anxiety. I thought only having panic attacks is anxiety, but my OCD has gone so much better. That was something I struggled pretty badly in the beginning of my junior year, so about a year ago. So for my anxiety, I do take supplements, not anti-anxiety meds, but I take a lot of supplements like ashwagandha or Calm from Array to really help and just ease me. My depression, I would say, is the most significant thing in my life that I really struggle with. It's more of a feeling of dullness and not feeling like I have... Like, I don't really have the highs as many people do, but when I am happy, I cherish it and I record it and I'm like, wow, I feel great. And it's really, it's really hard to struggle with mental health because it feels like nobody understands you. It feels like you can't share it with people. You know, something my therapist told me that really helped was when you meet someone or when you have a new friend, you give them little pockets of how you feel or something that's hard to share with them. And you see how they react. And if they start to react, then you know you can share a little bit more and a little bit more instead of just telling them, oh my God, I have this, this, and this. And they're like, oh my God, I don't, please don't tell me that. Because I've had people react in the way of telling me I'm selfish, which hurt. I've had people get mad at me. I've had people tell me all the good things in my life and the how to, why, why do I have depression if I have this, this, this? And I'm like, okay, it doesn't work like that. You know, so it's hard. It's hard when you feel alone. Also, I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed to tell some of my closest friends because I don't know, they've known me for so long and I'm I'm just not vulnerable like that sometimes. I also don't really want people to feel bad for me at the same time. Like, I don't want your sympathy. I just want you to care without me telling you to care. But now I want to tell you how I manage my mental health and how I'm still alive, basically. First off, for anxiety, I'm currently taking Calm by Array, which I have been loving. I also take ashwagandha sometimes, and I usually take that in the morning and then in the afternoon. I like to do really light movement, nothing that stresses my body out. My mind is already already so cluttered. I don't need sometimes to do something super hard and I eat very nourishing foods. I know that when I provide my body with the substance, the whole foods, everybody knows if you're eating fast food, if you're eating processed foods, if you're eating a ton of sugar, that's obviously not good for your brain. It's not good for your body as a whole. There is so much research coming out about the gut brain connection and a lot of it talks about how having a healthy gut microbiome can really improve your mental health and adding in probiotics and an overall balanced diet can really help with that gut microbiome and that is something I'm extremely extremely interested in and I'm always looking for a holistic way to make my mental health better because I don't want to go back on antidepressants. It freaked me out the first time and I'm just not the hugest fan of taking medication but we're going to talk about some ways that I try to make my mental health better and I encourage everybody else to make their mental health better. First one is getting in the sun. Exposure to the sunlight is is so closely correlated with an increase in serotonin production. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter linked to mood regulation. If you're having a lack of sunlight, especially during winter or you live in Seattle or somewhere where it rains a lot, This can contribute to seasonal affective disorder, such as being sad. Maybe if you do live in somewhere where there's a lot of rain and no sun, you can get one of those light bulbs that imitate the sun or something. Not only is being in the sun really important, but just being in nature. Go on a walk, get out in nature. I think it really humbles me and makes me feel grounded when I can go to the ocean. I can hear the sounds of the waves when... I can smell the salt water, put my sand in the feet. Also being with my dog in general, just seeing him run around so carefree and happy to be there. Surrounding yourself with people that love you. I try to see 
one person a week at least that I love. Uh, Currently, I'm seeing Max a couple times a week. They make you happy. They remind you why everything's worth it. It's the little moments in life that make you laugh. Maybe even someone to talk to when you're not feeling well. Um, Going to bed early. For myself, I realized this pretty quickly on that my thoughts and my algorithm on social media get a lot darker at night because it picks up on how you're feeling. There's no reason for myself to be up 11 past. I'm not being productive. My brain isn't being productive. I Nobody's awake for me to speak to. So if I'm getting sad, I'm getting sad alone. So going to bed early, but not only is going to bed early, but you're also getting yourself a better night's rest. And it's really important for your brain to get eight, nine plus hours a night. Not drinking alcohol. I drink alcohol every once in a while, but when I'm extremely drunk was when my thoughts get really dark. And not always anymore, but it has happened a couple times and I think your emotions are a lot heightened when you're drunk. Alcohol is a depressant, can really exaggerate your symptoms of anxiety and depression. I know when I'm when I'm drunk, my emotions are heightened. When I'm not on it, I can stable my mood a lot better. I'm more, a lot more rational. Obviously, I'm a huge I'm a huge advocate advocate for therapy. Some people have the misconception that therapy is just talking or you can talk to your friends or you can talk to yourself, but really therapy helps, they help you guide yourself. They reflect back to what you're thinking so you can hear it and make sure that's what you actually are feeling. They help you work through things. I loved my my therapist in college and I think that's why I stopped because I got another therapist and she just wasn't the vibe, you know? Um, she didn't understand me. She felt a little too robotic. But I think therapy can be another person for you to really express yourself. When I say I only maybe told five people about my mental health, like my actual mental health, that was one of my my therapist. I love that girl, lady. I felt she like truly saved me probably. She's, I felt like the only person I could talk to was my therapist. And you know, that's her job. <laughs> that's what she's getting paid for. But truly like, if you feel like you can't tell anyone without being judged or no one will listen, highly recommend seeing a therapist and whatever you're struggling in because they have all the resources for you. They have all the knowledge and will help you get out of whatever you're struggling with. Staying off social media is huge. I've done so many digital detoxes and my anxiety is immediately a relief. Um, I can't compare myself to people. I don't even start to think negative because it's not even in my aura. Staying off social media when you're going to bed, when you're waking up, you don't want to end and start your day on social media. It's not going to make you feel good. Or having boundaries around it. You can find boundaries, whether it's putting a timer on, a limit, unfollowing, muting people that don't make you feel good. Even when I was extremely depressed last year, uh, my social media, whatever I was posting, was extremely depressing. How you're feeling is what you're also going to produce. I just needed to stay off completely. Another thing is acupuncture. So acupuncture is a Chinese medicine practice. It's believed to balance the body's energy, alleviate alleviate symptoms of acne, depression, anxiety, all those things. And I definitely did that in high school. I would totally want to do that again. I don't think I really appreciate it. I don't think I appreciated the benefits it had at such a young age, but I... I really believe in the science behind that. So maybe that's something you want to try out if you feel like you've tried everything. Another thing I've been doing is regular yoga or breath work or meditation. I found a super cute little yoga studio by my house. I can actually walk there and it's very zen. It's all flow. It's not heated and everybody is there is just trying probably to relax. I feel like I'm getting a lot more flexible. Um, I'm clearing my head. I'm not exercising my body in a way that's hurting it. And it's a moment for me to take a break. I am going to yoga in a in like half an hour right now. And I was kind of bummed because I wanted to edit the podcast, but I forgot to cancel it in time. But yoga is really great to alleviate yourself, give yourself a break Something I learned in my health coaching class this week is our bodies run on, I'm forgetting what it's called, but there's a circadian rhythm and then there's a second one that's another rhythm within our body that's multiple times a day. And it basically says that every 90 minutes of extreme productivity, we need a 20 minute break to reset. 
And every time that we skip that 20 minute break, our productivity actually goes down throughout the day. But if we're doing a 20 minute break every 90 minutes of productivity, we will sustain that productivity. We will sustain our energy levels and our creativity. And I think that's something I really need to focus on because it's so easy to skip breakfast in the morning or work through your lunch break, not go to the bathroom, or just really push off every signal your body is telling you that you need food, you're tired, you need to go outside and get a walk. And we always try to push off those signals because we're like, not right now. I'm too busy. I have too much work to do. When our body's like, please just listen to me. Something else that... I've honestly recently been doing is journaling. I have always journaled since I was a little kid. I always get in and out of it all the time. Journaling is a space, a private space for you to explore your thoughts and your emotions. I like to do a lot of mind dumps and just everything on my brain, get it out. I also really like to do um, things I'm grateful for because it helps me go to bed thinking about all the good things in my life. I appreciate all the little things. I even go so granular. It's like, I'm so appreciated for this friend, for the sun, for the meals that get sent to me, for my dog or my water filter, like as little as it can get. I'm so grateful for those things. And it makes me remember the day in a good way versus reflecting on the all the bad perhaps you can consider doing a digital detox like i said getting off social media or just doing a small break throughout the day i think that it will really help reduce exposure to information overload and potential sources of your stress maybe you don't know where your stress and anxiety comes from and you go off instagram for a day or a week or you mute all your messages and you realize, oh, I haven't gotten any notifications today. Maybe my anxiety is from the 100 texts I'm getting or the group chat that keeps blowing up and I never respond to. It will help you maybe guide you into whatever is causing you unnecessary stress and you can form a small maybe boundary, I want to say, or like maybe you find out that um, that group chat you're in with 20 girls that goes off constantly all day really gives you stress and anxiety for some reason. So you decide to just mute it and you go into it once a day to respond, but you don't need those messages obliterating you every single day and then you can figure out something to do from there. Second to last thing maybe that can help your mental health is engaging in community events so whether that's activities or support groups just having people that account for you every week every month can help you socially can help you with connection when i was in high school i went to church four times a week i uh, definitely don't do that anymore that was my source of connection that was my source of community and i felt very involved and supported in that way i definitely want to join some type of sports group in orange county i try to go to a run club i'm trying to build my community here where i'm living it's definitely a lot harder than said but I think if you're in college it's a lot easier join maybe a workout class that's even like a credit for it or there's so many intramural sports I don't know why I never did one there's a lot of ways to build community it doesn't have to be athletic it can be creative as well or a book club but somewhere where you're seeing the same people over and over again and you'll slowly build a connection or friendship with some of them my very very last one for you guys is to connect with animals spending time with your pets or with horses or at the ocean with the fish i don't really know or maybe you're volunteering is so beneficial i don't know if you know this okay but hugging someone for 20 seconds i think or more really releases serotonin or dopamine or one of those. It's actually the same thing for a dog. So I try to hug Miso. I hug him way more than 20 seconds. That's why there's therapy in art. There's therapy with horses. There's all these different types of therapies and ways to improve people's mental health because it actually scientifically works. Let me tell you, Miso has dramatically improved my mental health Honestly, I was spot on, like caring for someone else, taking him on walks, making sure he's fed, he has water, making sure he goes to the vet. He's my baby and I love him more than anything. I protect him like no other and that really has helped to be honest. Another thing, it's a lot, a lot of work. So definitely don't get a dog if you don't have the time and the commitment. Maybe get a cat or something a little bit low maintenance. 
But I definitely recommend getting a dog if you are in that place of being able to provide and give them the care that they need. But overall, I think personally, a lot of my mental health comes with my with my lack of connection, with my lack of maybe relationships that feel deep enough. And that is something definitely I'm working on in therapy within myself, also my self-esteem and my self-confidence. It's definitely a very long journey I hope to overcome one day. Obviously, everybody has a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of depression, but I want to make mine more manageable, less significant in my life. Something that I can talk to people, talk to my kids one day about this is what I struggled with, but this is how far I've come since then. And this is what I recommend if you need any advice. I'm so glad that I am going through this and that I have these experiences because it makes me more empathetic. It makes me a better friend because I will never be one of those people that have reacted to me so poorly and made me feel so much worse than I already did in that moment by telling them that their depression, their anxiety is so selfish and yada, 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 whatever somebody has told me before, I understand what it really feels like and that is not how you respond to someone who is struggling. Then talking to you openly, voluntarily, who is already probably so nervous, so being so vulnerable and then being shut down, like I hope to never be that person and I hope to be the person where my friends come to because they know I've struggled with this and they need someone to hold their hand in the process or feel like they're not alone and I hope sharing this helps someone feel like they're not alone and they know someone that's felt like this before. I want to say in this moment that my DMs are always open if you need someone to talk to. This is such a heavy topic. You know, sometimes I wish I did have someone to reach out to. I know so many people, so many of my good friends would have talked to me, but I was kind of traumatized from the bad ones. So that's all I have for you guys for this episode. Thank you, thank you so much for listening. This is, I'm pretty sure, the 30th episode, which is wild to think about. If you could please share the show, rate it, or comment, or whatever it is you can do. Um, Share it with a friend. Know that you're not alone. You are so beautiful, confident, intelligent, and are going to do so many great things. Follow the pod on Instagram, on TikTok, on all the things. I am trying to post weekly. That is my goal always, but eventually... You know, it'd be really cool to post twice a week. So I hope you guys have a great rest of your week and I love you all so, so much. I'll talk to you next week. Bye.